Welcome uh, to the Father's House, Orange County. My name is Preston Butler III. Amen. Amen. Uh, amen. Uh, uh, I'm just so excited today. Um, and before I get started, before I do anything else, I have to take a second and honor the best pastors in the world, our leaders of this house, pastors Matthew and Bianca Oltoff. Amen. Um, they are not here with us physically, but I know they're here with us in spirit. They are actually over in Israel leading a group of 60 plus people. Amen. So we send some love to you all, all the way on the other side of the globe. Uh, just know that we love you. We love you and we miss you. Amen. And uh, whether you're joining us online or you're in the video experience or you're here in person um, on behalf of our pastors, I just want to say that I'm, I'm so excited that you've joined us here in worship today. You could be anywhere. And uh, we have a saying here at the Father's house that everyone has a seat at the table. That means that no matter who you are, what you've done, where you come from, that you are welcome here. And I don't know how you ended up here. I don't know if your mama dragged you to church this morning, you stumbled in off of Birch Street, or somebody sent you this message. But I believe that it is not by coincidence. I believe that there is a special word that God has for you today. And we're going to be continuing in our identity series, Know Yourself. When you know better, you do better. And today we're going to be diving into a topic that has always been a major, major part of my life and has become even more tangible in the past few months. But first, before we do that, let's recap real quick, okay? So week one, Pastor Matt spoke about daddy issues, that you are loved by a heavenly father and that you are a child of God. And then Pastor B, she brought a word. She said, who am I? That you were not defined by your failures, but you were defined by a good, good father. And this week, I'm going to pick up right where they left off, but I want to start out by opening the word of God. I want to read a passage out of 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. It says, we have a priceless inheritance. Somebody say priceless. priceless. An inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled beyond the reach of change and decay. For my note takers in here, the title of my message this week, you've already said it, is I'm expensive. Somebody say, I'm expensive. I'm expensive. Today, I want to remind you that you are worth more. And every week, we have been building on our definition of identity. Pastor Matt told us in the first week that I'm a child of God with the Heavenly Father who loves me. Pastor B told us last week, I am chosen. I am royalty. I am holy. I am special and I am called by God. Well, this week, we're adding there is a priceless inheritance for me and I know my value. Now, there is a fundamental element of identity that affects each and every one of us. Sites like Ancestry.com, 23andMe sites where you can discover your heritage and your lineage, they are rooted in this core of identity. And, you know, have you ever wondered why uh, genealogies are in the Bible? It's like, you know, we got like 10 verses of this person begat this person, and this is who dad, this person's daddy is, and this is who this person's uncle. Okay? I'm like, Lord, why do I need to know all that information, right? Well, it's your family line to show you who you are and where you come from. There is an emphasis on the fact that the past heavily influences the present. That what came before you changes how you view your identity. And you cannot truly know yourself unless you understand the context of who and where you come from. Now, I know that in our current climate of individualism, oh, it's all about me, my truth, right? I'm a do me. It's easy to think that who we are is solely based on ourselves. But that is simply not true, especially not as Christians. When you accept salvation, when you become a Christian, Scripture tells us that your identity changes. That the old has gone and the new is here. That you go from being a slave to sin to a son or daughter of God and therefore an heir to the throne of God. You go from being a slave to royalty. That's an upgrade if I ever heard one. Now, let me put it like this, okay? My BC price, my before Christ price, 
Ain't today's price, player. Okay? Through Christ, the value of your identity increases. Through Christ, the value of your identity increases. So that means I'm expensive. Somebody say, I'm expensive. But check this out. Don't miss this, okay? Um, Because I know somebody was like, ooh, yes, I'm expensive. Me. Yes. But don't miss this, okay? The the markup, right? The, the, The increase of the value of your identity actually didn't even have anything to do with you. You inherited value when you were adopted into the royal family of God. And Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians that you were bought with a price. Jesus paid the ultimate price with his life to give us access to a godly inheritance. But here's the thing. Despite the fact that we have access to this priceless, godly inheritance, there are far too many of us walking around like clearance item Christians. Christians who are unaware of their worth, selling themselves short, negotiating with sin. But when you understand the value of your godly inheritance, it allows you to live out your true and holy identity. As a child of God, you are designer made, handcrafted by the God of the universe. As a child of God, God, you are blood bought. That means that Jesus, the savior of the universe, died specifically for you. As a child of God, you are a royal heir to the one and true king. You are expensive. And you are worth more. But there are too many Christians who are living beneath their privilege. That's why today I want to talk to you about your godly inheritance. When you value your godly inheritance, it changes the way you live. Somebody say, I'm expensive. expensive. Now, as I mentioned earlier, inheritance has always been something that has been a part of my life. Um, and I'm so excited. I actually have my, my parents, my mom and dad, who are here with us uh, this morning. Amen. Uh, but inheritance has always been a big part of my life because I actually inherited my name from my father and my grandfather. Amen. And uh, my, my grandfather there in the middle, Preston Sr., um, he's gone on to be with the Lord. Amen. But he was a great man of God and he served as a bishop. Not only that, he built his church with his own hands, and uh, including the hands of his children, my dad included. And uh, it's funny because Chris was talking about, he said, man, I don't know how to build a church. Well, listen, my papa didn't know how to build one either. I said, papa, you just was like, I'm going to go build a building? And he was like, well, you know, you just uh, watch and some people do it and you just have trust and faith in the God for the rest. I said, papa, now hold on, now hold on, hold on. I'm going to need some faith like you because I don't know if I could build a building and say that I was feeling, believing that it was going to stand, okay? (laughs) Well, my father, who is also pictured in this picture, and what's beautiful about this is that we're actually standing in the expansion of my grandfather's church. My dad actually preached a sermon there in the church because it grew so much they had to build another building. My dad, my father, Preston Jr., has pastored overseas and here in the States. And y'all, look, it gets better because, listen, I got a double portion, all right? On my mom's side, my great-grandfather pastored and also built churches. Then his son, my grandfather, was also a bishop. Then my mama is an evangelist. She serves as the regional missionary for the San Diego region, amen? It's no wonder I felt called to preach. I don't know, you know. My bloodline, my lineage, my heritage has led me here to preach and teach right now. And as I continue to grow and discover my identity, I realize how much of my family's spiritual history has shaped me. And it has influenced how I see myself. My mama calls me her knee-ology baby. She says she had to pray real hard for me. She learned to get down on her knees. Amen. And because of their display of faith, the passing down of biblical truths, I believe to my core that I am not just their child, but I am a child of God, that I am indeed expensive. I know without a shadow of a doubt that I am living and inherited, excuse me, I know without a shadow of a doubt that I inherited the blessings of the generations that came before me. 
And what's beautiful is that now, Christine, my wife and I, we're now parents. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Hey, listen, you know you got a beautiful baby. When you see your baby, you're like, dang. <laughs> my baby's here, and I seen her in the, lo- in the living room. I said, dang, you a beautiful baby, okay? <laughs> but now we have the opportunity to build a legacy and to leave an inheritance of our own. Yeah. Now, I have to take a quick detour here, okay, because I fully understand that not everybody has the same experience as me. That not everybody has the, the, the blessing and the opportunity to come from such a rich spiritual family line. And that for many of you, you actually may have complicated associations with this idea of inheritance. That some of you may know, some of you may not know or even have a relationship with your earthly family. So you don't feel like you have an inheritance at all. Some of you may have relationships with your families, but the inheritance that you've received is riddled with trauma and pain and generational curses. And for others, maybe it's the opposite. Maybe you've actually inherited good things, but the problem is they're just that, things. Money, land, good looks. (laughs) But unfortunately, I have to let you know, it's all going to fade away. And if you can relate, relate to any of those situations or you find yourself struggling to connect to this, this idea of inheritance, I want to let you know today that as a child of God, you are more than what you are born into. You are more than what you are born into. You are not limited by your natural inheritance. Jordan Menares, a volunteer of the, the kids ministry, she told me this and I had never forgot it. You are more than what you are born into. Paul tells us that we have an inheritance that is pure, undefiled, that cannot change or fade away. This is a godly inheritance. And through this inheritance, you have the power to overcome anything that has been passed down to you that was meant to harm you, that was meant to keep you from experiencing freedom and the abundant life that you are entitled to as a child of God. You are more than what you were born into. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm expensive. (laughs) So what is included in this godly inheritance? Well, I'm going to keep it real simple. There are three things that I believe we inherit as children of God. The first is the promises of God. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, it says, Because of his glory, he has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. Your inheritance gives you access to the promises of God. Well, what kind of promises? Well, he has promised you perfect peace. That means peace even in the middle of chaos. He has promised you prosperity and protection. He has promised that he will never leave you nor forsake you, that he works all things together for your good. And y'all, these are just a few, but you are entitled to all of the promises that are included in the word of God through being a child of God. The second thing that we inherit is the power of God. Acts chapter 1 verse 8, this is the last thing that Jesus says on earth. After this, he says, beam me up, Father. Um, (laughs) <laughs> um, he says, but you will receive power. And because my parents are here, you know, I did this. I, I grew up Pentecostal, okay? So I got to say this the way you got to say it. You will receive power. That's how they used to say, okay? You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And that through this power, you will become witnesses, telling all people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria, in Orange County, in L.A., in the East Coast, and the West Coast, all over the world, until the ends of the earth. Your inheritance gives you access to the power of God. Well, power to do what? And actually, you know what, before I even go there, I want to make this clear. It's not like you got to be like a high and mighty priest to have the power of God. Each and every one, if you're a child of God, if you're saved... You accept the salvation. You have access to the power of God, power to heal, power to perform miracles, power to prophesy, power to do the impossible, power over the enemy. You have access to that power. 
We inherit the promises and the power of God. Third, we inherit the family of God. And I love, I love this one. In Scripture, it tells us that we are all related as brothers and sisters in Christ. That we are bonded through the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. When you can't see the promises in your own life, when you can't feel the power of God, your family is there to support you. And this is actually why here at the Father's House we put such an emphasis on joining a community group. Which is great because you can sign up today. They still sign it up, okay? Listen, a community group is literally time carved out in your schedule for you to bond with the family of God. Paul says it this way in Romans 12, verses 4 through 5. He says, just as each one of us has one body with many members, not all of the members do the same thing. So in Christ, we, all of us, who are many, are one body. And each member belongs to one another. I belong to you. You belong to me. We belong to each other as the family of God. And when it comes to how the family of God increases your value as a child of God, I love to use the example of the Mona Lisa. Okay? The Mona Lisa is a painting by Leonardo da Vinci. I had to be really careful to say that because I always want to say Leonardo DiCaprio. Uh, <laughs> Leonardo, it was painted by Leonardo da Vinci in 1519. And the Mona Lisa is priceless. It is said that any speculative price, any price tag that you could put on the Mona Lisa would probably be so high that not one person would be able to purchase and maintain the painting. But here's the catch. The Mona Lisa is not famous just because it's an incredible painting or because you can't tell whether she's really smiling or not. Okay. It is the history of the Mona Lisa that is what aided in its value. It was famously stolen from the Louvre in 1911. And as time went, its notability grew because it was the most referenced work of art of all time. It is the story behind the Mona Lisa that gives it a priceless value. In the same way, the value of our identity is also based on the amazing, miracle-filled story of the children of God. So what does that mean? That means we get to stand on the shoulders of giants in the faith, the ones that are included in the Bible. Noah, Esther, Moses, Matthew, Mark, Luke, James, John, Paul, Jesus. That's your fam. That, that is, we are in the same spiritual bloodline. So it would, be, it would be ignorant of me to walk around with my head down like I ain't got no kind of confidence, like I ain't got no kind of family. It's just woe is me by myself. I'm struggling. I love Jesus, but you know, it's a struggle, my brother. Listen, I walk with my head up saying I'm with them. Their cred is my cred. So if we have access to the promises and the power of God, access to the family of God, why in the world we got clearance item Christians? Why, why don't we walk in the fullness of our inheritance? Well, the same way that Pastor Matt told us that we have daddy issues, we also have inheritance issues. These are what I call the three U's. The first issue that we have is that we're unaware. We simply don't know what we are entitled to as sons and daughters of God. And y'all, I said this in my last message. Look, you got to read the Bible to know what's in it. You don't know what promises are due to you or what power you have if you're unaware. And look, look at it like this. If, God forbid, one of your family members pass away and you inherit something from them, you're going to read the fine print, ain't you? <laughs> unaware. Another inheritance issue is that once you feel you are aware, you actually feel like you're unworthy. You said, man, if you knew what I do, you knew what I did, you know what I struggle with, you don't know where I come from, man. We believe those things disqualify us from our godly inheritance. But God knows all and he sees all. And in fact, Paul tells us in Romans that while we were still sinners... While we were still in our mess, Christ still died for you. 
So being perfect is not a prerequisite. If you are a child of God, you have access to your godly inheritance. The only prerequisite that you have is to accept salvation. Paul tells us another way in Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 and 29. He says, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Jesus Christ. It don't matter where you come from. It don't matter what your background is. It don't matter what you did. You are all one. And if you belong to Christ, if you're a child of God, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the purpose. If you belong to Christ, if you're a child of God, you are eligible for your godly inheritance, period. And the last issue that I want to focus on today is that we underestimate. When we underestimate our inheritance, we trade it for fool's gold, quick fixes, or we simply just give it away. Adam and Eve, they traded the Garden of Eden for what they thought would be better than what God had given them. When we, when we give in to our fleshly desires for a false sense of instant gratification, we become like Esau. He underestimated the value of his inheritance and he traded his birthright for a bowl of stew. A lifetime of blessing for a moment of hunger. Other times when we underestimate our inheritance, we find ourselves giving away altogether. The children of Israel, when they were freed from Egypt, Moses came, let my people go, right? Pharaoh was like, nah, they sent the plagues. He finally says, all right, get out of here. He frees them. And then they're standing there at the Red Sea. God miraculously opens the Red Sea, allows the children of Israel to walk all the way over with Pharaoh's army right behind them. They get swallowed up and now they're free. Don't you know that people started complaining, talking about it's hot. We, we only got manna to eat, Jesus. And do you know they said, actually, God, it'd be better if we went back and we were slaves back in Egypt than to be here. They underestimated the value of the promised land. And do you know that that entire generation of people had to die before they were able to enter into the promised land? They literally gave their inheritance away. It would be a shame. Now, we can look at them and be like, oh, dang, that's crazy, bro. But, hey, I know I've been guilty of this. It would be a shame for us to lose out on what is rightly ours because we're unaware or we feel unworthy or we, underest or we underestimate our value. But see, here's the other thing that's also at play. Uh, it says that Satan is looking to kill, steal, and destroy. And y'all, I always wondered, like, why is steal, like, placed in between kill and destroy? Like, murder, petty theft. It's just not the same. Like, I don't, I don't get it. But it didn't really hit me until I looked at it through the lens of inheritance. See, because the devil understands that if he can steal your inheritance, better yet, if he can convince you to give it away for free, he don't need to kill you or destroy you. You'll do it yourself. If he can just convince you to give a little bit of your inheritance away here, or just give a little bit away there, like, hey, God, you know, it's just this one time, you know, or oh, there's grace, right? Oh, come on, I just need just a little tiny bit, God. No, you know what? Lord, this is the last time. <laughs> well, the last time was the last time. And all of a sudden, you're finally, you find yourself completely distanced from God in the dark, depressed, angry, bitter, confused. We'll find ourselves like the prodigal son that Pastor Matt spoke about in week one. He went took his father's inheritance before he died. He went away to a faraway land. He had all his fun. He did all his dirt. And then he realized that he had spent all of his inheritance and there was nothing left. See, the devil wants to separate you from your godly inheritance because he knows if he can strip you of your identity as a child of God, if he can convince you that you're worthless and not expensive, if he can make you forget that you're heavenly royalty, then he can actually define you. He can tell you things like nobody loves you. Come on, you know you ain't never going to be nothing, just like your daddy and your daddy's daddy. Come on, you know you're too broken, you're too young, you're too old, you're too insignificant, you're too uneducated, you're too unqualified. The family of God, you? Come on, bro, be for real. 
And because we don't know what we're actually entitled to, because we've lost our identity, we start to believe it. But there's a reason Satan is called the father of lies. He simply wants you to believe these lies so you begin to misidentify yourself. This is why it is so important to know what you are entitled to through your godly inheritance as a child of God. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm expensive. And this is why even though your inheritance is given to you freely, right? You didn't have to do anything to earn it. It's actually going to cost you something to keep it. And that's my last point for today. It costs to keep it. Now that you know that you're expensive, you got to start acting like it. When you know the value of your inheritance, it should change the way you live. That means you should live in a manner that honors the legacy that you've been given. We have to sacrifice our fleshly desires. Right? Because expensive... Don't go to the places that it used to go to. Expensive don't talk like it used to talk. Expensive has standards, and those standards are in alignment with what the Word of God says. We cannot think that we can benefit from the blessings of being a child of God. We got promises and power, and we're part of the family of God but then we don't follow the rules of the Father. I said, ooh, Jesus, ouch. We can't think that we can benefit from the blessings of being a child of God and not follow the rules of the Father. That means we have to pursue holiness. We have to obey his voice and his commands. So I got a practical action, just something for you to do this week. It's real simple. This is what I want you to do. I want you to reflect And identify one action, one habit, one behavior, one thought that you have that is beneath your privilege as a child of God. And if you're like, I don't really know what that means, or if you need a litmus test, let me put it this way. Okay? If you had kids, would you pass that action, that habit, that thought, that behavior down to them? If you wouldn't, you need to cut it. And actually, for some of you, I want to encourage you this week because I understand that when we actually start to look at our natural inheritance, the things that were passed down from our grandparents, the things that were passed down from our parents, it actually might be some ugly stuff that you find. It might open up some wounds that you didn't know were there. But I I have to encourage you to be brave. I have to encourage you to face these things head on because it's great to understand that you have a godly inheritance, but you've also got to know in the natural the things that were set up to try to kill you. You've got to know what the enemy planted in your bloodline that tried to stop you from living in the fullness of your inheritance. You can't ignore those things and they're not just going to go away. But I guarantee you, if you do, if you take this time of reflection, You begin to identify the things that you are doing that are not in alignment with being a child of God. You have access to a life that is abundant. That is what is promised to you as a child of God. I want to leave you all with the testimony of one of our volunteers here at the church. He's one of my good brothers. His name is Riach Reese. Amen. And if you've been to TFHOC in person, then you've probably seen him at the merch table out in the living room. And uh, you probably haven't heard him, though, because he's a very quiet brother. Uh, He's a man of few words. (laughs) But I wanted to share Riach's story because he actually showed me an image that he made many years ago called Runs in the Family. And Riach, he serves on our creative team and his wife, Carla. She serves in the care ministry, and they're actually in Israel right now. But I I said, hey, man, I know you're on the other side of the planet, bro. But listen, I need you to send me that image that you showed me. Because the image that you made is such a powerful visual metaphor of inheritance. What what you all may not know about Riach is that he is actually an extremely gifted athlete. He actually still holds the high school record for the fastest 100 meter in the state of Ohio. 
Amen. Yes. And he was actually training for the Olympics. So this picture, it's his grandfather passing a baton to his father, passing the baton to him. And this is actually, if you're not familiar with track and field, this is actually a relay. And in the relay, you have this baton. And there are four people, and they run in this race. And the baton is passed down to the next person. They run the part of the race. The baton is passed down to the next person, and so on and so on. And unfortunately, the pandemic interrupted Riach's dreams of becoming an Olympian. And during this time, he was forced to reevaluate his identity. And, you know, I had this mental picture of him holding the baton of his inheritance in his hand and holding it up to a mirror. And I believe he began to see some things that he did not like to see. He began to see that some things were handed down to him that were actually inhibiting him from running the race that God called him to run. He began to see that there were some things that were detrimental that actually had the same effect it was having in his parents' marriage and his own marriage. He started to see that there were some things that he had been exposed to as a child that he shouldn't have been. But also, I believe that he began to realize that the baton that was handed to him doesn't have to be the same baton that he hands to the next generation. Because what happened is Riach actually started investing in the church. He started volunteering. He and his wife joined and then led community groups. He reached out to a couple young married men, myself included, and got plugged into the family of God. And I have to tell you right now, I, in the past three years, I have seen a complete identity transformation in Riach. His marriage began to blossom. He discovered that he had a voice and that he actually needed to use it. He discovered that God actually had more for him, that he was more than what he is born into. He realized that he was expensive, that God wanted to use him to reach his people. And here I am being able to share his testimony with you all today. You are expensive. You are worth more. I don't care what the culture says. I don't care what the person in the third grade told you that you know. I don't care. God says that you are his. You're a child of God and you are expensive. So here's what I want to do. We've been talking about inheritance, the family of God. Well, I need us here in the room to do something, okay? I need you to turn to your neighbor, the left or the right, and I need you to connect with them. I need you to grab their hand, hold their shoulder, reach out and touch elbows. I want us to connect as the family of God. And if you're online, I want you just to stretch a hand out. We are stretching a hand out and connecting with you right now. I want you to understand that each of us are connected, that we have a godly inheritance. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pray over you. But as I pray, I want you to intercede for your brother and your sister. I want you to continue to pray out loud. So let's pray together. Dear God, I thank you so much for your children. God, I thank you so much for being unworthy, but being adopted into the royal family of God. God, I am so humbled that you call us sons and daughters. And Lord, I pray right now against any barriers that are keeping us from the fullness of our godly inheritance, God. I pray, Lord, that you fill us up with your anointing. I pray that you fill us up, God, with your boldness, God, to face our natural inheritance in the face and say, I have a godly inheritance which supersedes that, that I will not be overcome by those things, that what is given to me by my Father, my Heavenly Father, is greater than all I could ever receive, that I have access to the power, promises, and family of God. And Lord, we believe right now that generations to come are going to be changed, God. That people are going to make decisions to live differently based on the value of their inheritance, God. Father, we love you and we pray these things in Jesus' name. And everyone says, Amen. 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 Now, 
I cannot leave here today without reminding you there is one prerequisite to accessing your godly inheritance, and that is accepting salvation. What does that mean? The God of the universe sent his son Jesus down in human form. He died on the cross as a sacrifice for me and you and everyone who has ever lived. But he didn't stay in the grave. He resurrected and he had all power from the grave. And when he did that, he gave you access to have a godly inheritance. He did that so you could have access to power, promises, and family. All you have to do is accept his salvation. So I want to give you that opportunity today. If you want to walk in the fullness of, a, of an abundant life, a life that is guaranteed to you as a child of God, I'm going to count to three in just a second and I want you to raise your hand. When you raise your hand, you're doing three things. One, you're saying, God, I acknowledge that Jesus died for my sins and that he resurrected from the grave with all power in his hands. Two, you're saying, God, cleanse me, forgive me of all my mistakes, which is called sin. And three, you are inviting the Holy Spirit, God's power, into your life. So if that's you today, if you want to walk in the fullness of your godly inheritance, if you want access to promises and power and family of God, if that's you today, I want you to raise your hand in one, two, three. Hallelujah. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. Listen, if you're in the video experience, if you're online, we believe that there are hands going up all over the globe and we see you and we rejoice. Hey, listen, can we just give a shout of praise because some people just got adopted into the royal family of God today. Amen. If you rose your hand, if that was you, I want you to repeat these words after me. And actually, because we're the family of God, I want us to say it all together so they know that they're not alone. Amen. Repeat after me. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus thank you for dying for my sins. Thank you for dying for my sins. Come into my heart today. Come into my heart today. Forgive me of my sins. Forgive me of my sins. Give me the power, Give me the power to live for you, to live for, you. For, all for all of my days. I love you. I love you. Amen.